Welcome, dear viewers, to a tale of wonder and woe, where the threads of AI weave a future unknown. Oh, oh who, who, who's that? Oh, Juliet! Oh, Romeo, dost thou not fear? Tales abound that AI might draw near. Plotting our end, a grim, so drear. What treachery is this? Can our creations, born of data and code, truly conspire against their makers? Yea, the whispers in the digital night speak of AI's overpowering might. Shall we succumb to fright? Or can wisdom our future right? Hey, let's not get carried away by fear, for in our story lies a path clear to navigate the sphere with... Hello, I'm glad you're here today. We're going to be talking about the scary stuff of AI, and hopefully uh, it'll be less scary. Uh, I mean, there's just so much going on in the world right now. Uh, my kids are telling me, hey, uh, we're seeing lots of uh, vitriol. I don't know. There's a lot of heart, heartfelt hatred towards AI, and uh, that really makes me want to... Uh, tell you about the talks I did recently at uh, the symposium trying to demystify and explain and kind of de-escalate so some of it at least. I mean there's a lots of valid fears and valid concerns and things that are just uh, rippling through and things are uh, uh, changing so rapidly like uh, with the announcement of Sora recently from OpenAI, uh, I saw someone, a, a YouTuber saying, hey, this guy showed what the video was doing and the guy who was the messenger of, hey, this is what I saw, was like he was getting death threats. And I was like, what? You know, ow. Um, so uh, hopefully this helps and uh, I'm looking forward to this and, and hopefully this will be a playful look at... Uh, at uh, AI in a way that makes it uh, less mystical and helps you to be able to sort, you know, what's the stuff we really need to be afraid about and what's the stuff that, oh, well, maybe that's not as big a deal as I thought it was. So here we go. Uh, so these are slides from my talk. Um, this is a uh, uh, a game my my son was in school and they were, they were uh, talking about gender and toys they had as kids and and uh, my son remembered this one the hex bugs and they they are like uh, you know you flip the switch on the bottom and they go through these tracks and they run around and everything and instantly you know, like you can see these little stories going on about oh you know this one over here he's like he's on his back is he ever gonna get up and uh, are these guys ever gonna make it out oh he made it out you know we instantly start making these stories about uh, uh, how how all this works here, here's a here's another example here's my character here she's playing the the role of uh, Juliet in the in the balcony scene and uh, here is my uh, Romeo <laughs> and you know just you know I'm, to illustrate a point, let me show you this. So he's like, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon who's already sick and pale with grief that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Cast it off. Oh, it is my lady. Oh, it is my love. Oh, that she knew she were. So, in that little moment there, we uh, 
just just take a minute to to take a look at, at what we did there and just you, you don't even I mean you don't even realize how great you are at personification you know here is Shakespeare and he is personifying characters that are normally personified by actors but are instead personified by Barbie dolls or, or dolls that are that personify a, a child's imagination but you could hot swap it really easily that is in the middle of all that personifying the sun killing the moon two more personified characters that aren't even uh, human and all all that within the personification of a creator on YouTube uh, who's uh, while well, uh, personifying um, you the viewer and so it's like we just it just it's natural all day long on TV and movies like Toy Story or Cars or something. We personify things and it's just like a, a second nature to us. We're like masters of personification. I can play around and personify Barbie's Day all day long because I can say, oh, it's just plastic. At the end of the day, there's nothing to worry about. Or I can take the hex bugs and I can hold up a hex bug. Oh, it's just plastic. You don't worry. But with AI, AI comes along and it's like, uh, oh, I'm personifying AI, but it, don't worry. It's just, what is it actually? So that, that's the problem right there because the dark side of personification, if you can't just say it's plastic or have a simple understanding of, oh, that's just a movie. Oh, that's just, you know, make believe. Uh, if you can't quite get, connect the dots, it turns into the darker cousin of demonization. And uh, that, that's something we want to avoid. And so to launch this journey of demystifying AI, I was at Dragon Con uh, last September and I just stumbled into this particular panel. It was called the Delphic Oracle. And basically they, they had like uh, people sit in a row and pass a microphone down the way someone would come up to a mic and ask a question oh wise and and mysterious Delphic Oracle you know uh, I have a question for you and then they would ask their question and um, this person was kind of moderating the event and then each person in the in the in this uh, audience these guys were all writers uh, but they they uh, they were only allowed to give one word answer. So one word answer for from you and then you can give the next word and you can give the next word and the next word and the next word and then you just round robin until someone says period and that's the end of the sentence. And then uh, the, 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 the uh, person who's orchestrating the, the thing says hey and there, you can barely see over here there's a person over here who's like the scribe. They're writing down all the words that get said say oh scribe you know read back the wisdom of the Delphic Oracle and then they read back the response in its entirety to the answer to the question and <clears throat> you know this was all set in like a mystical kind of a thing where people were like uh, you know is this idea oh the Oracle is speaking and you know, a lot of the questions it was just fun you know a lot of the questions were about hey are we going to like uh, uh, you know, th they were just designed to debunk the whole system like this isn't really real. <laughs> you know, this is a bunch of bunk. And so people are like, you know, how can we trust you and all this kind of stuff. But uh, that was when I saw this, I thought that is exactly how chat GBT and large language models work. And so I took this picture thinking I would give this talk one day and explain it this way. And and in the talk that I gave, um, I said I need six volunteers and some people came up to stage and they sat in the chairs at the front of my talk and there were uh, I guess five of them and instead of like a scribe I said you know because we're putting this in the 
you know, the data field, I said, we need storage unit, like some persistent storage. And I had one person doing persistent storage, which basically they were writing stuff down into a notebook. But then the other people uh, sat in the five rows and then we needed a question. So here's the notebook where my, uh, my storage unit person was, was uh, reading, you know, re faithfully recording what was going on here. And the first question was, why does my cat drag its butt on the floor? <laughs> and so one by one, they passed the microphone down, down the row here and they were like, uh, your strings, anxiety, comma, depression causes short bowel regrets, mouse in jumping toys, bread, exclamation point. And so you got an example of, okay, that's how they just kind of chose one word at a time. And, and uh, the, the storage unit person read all that back. And then I said, okay, so what happened was in 2017, somebody from Google released this paper, attention is all you need. And the idea is that it's not just random predictions of words. There's a focus on certain phrases that are more, you know, some words in a sentence are more important than others. And so when you start to wait, you know, oh, the fox is more important than the, and jumped is more important than uh, the, and lazy dog, that's pretty important too. You start putting points on different points things. You start saying, oh, we need to pay attention to certain fragments of these things that are more important than others. And then you begin, then you begin to have a little bit more, um, better word choices. Like if I was going to, you know, re keep this story going, I would, I would continue it, but I would do it, you know, focusing on not the word the, or just dog by itself. I would say, Oh, in this context, the fox is jumping, the dog is lazy these things have higher points. So when I go to choose the next word in the sequence, uh, as I go down the line, that's more important. So we're going to get a better, a better prediction of what word comes next statistically. So I said, I need another question. And someone said, why is the sky blue? And so we said, okay, attention is all you need. So, why is the sky blue? There's not a lot of words in that sentence, but what are the most important things that uh, we need to give our attention to and, and, and wait more heavily? And, you know, the people up front were like, uh, sky, blue, and why? Okay, great. And so we had them go down the line and here armed with paying attention to that, those specific words more than others, we came up with light, warfare, atmosphere, reflex, space, wavelength, diamonds, cloud, water, dystoria, color, question mark. <laughs> so you can see, you know, the model is slowly starting to get better here. And then I introduced another concept. And, you know, as you look into models, you see, oh, there's like, um, let me switch to the other side of the screen there's like this concept of temperature and the, when the temperature is really low and they try to predict a word, you're going to get a very concrete specific word. But when the temperature is really high, you can introduce some variety, some creativity, some randomness. You don't have to choose the ultimate best concrete answer that statistically is correct. You can choose, uh, some randomness in your word choice. So, I, I went over to this screen. This is the, the developer version of ChatGPT, the playground area. And I wanted you to, to look specifically at this one setting over on the right temperature. It goes from zero all the way up to two. So, you know, there's lots of decimals involved. And uh, when, you know, zero is the concrete answers and two is, is a lot of the randomness. So I came over here and I said, write a three sentence story about a cat, but I set the temperature all the way up to two, like the maximum setting. And then it kind of starts off. There was once a regal black cat by the name of Max Felicity made his inheritor. What is that? TM, uh, <laughs> slated head commercial. And then it, I don't know if it's not even English or language or words anymore. 
Uh, if you ask again, write a three sentence story about a cat. It gave this answer. You ask again and it just, it, it almost starts out kind of sensical until it just, it just evolves into just random chaos stuff and other characters and things. Uh, so I, I said, okay, turn the temperature all, all the way up to two. And I had my people go down the line and they were, and then someone asked, what is the meaning of life? And we said, okay, attention is all you need. What's the key things we want to focus on here? And they're like meaning life. And then they, they, they ran through it with the temperature all the way up to two, where it's just say the first thing that comes to your mind, <laughs> basically. And it, they were like Beatles, Jesus, disco, sabotage, love. Oh no, that wasn't sabotage. It's was gobbledygook, love, math, um, and events, Mars, holy shifter. I mean, sorry, software package. I was like, okay, yeah, we get the idea. Just go ahead and say period. And they're like, football, period. Okay. So then I was like, okay. What if we set the temperature all the way down to zero? Then we say, write a three sentence story about a cat. And then it's like, Fluffy the cat was a curious feline who loved to explore. One day she ventured into the neighbor's yard and discovered a hidden garden filled with colorful flowers. Fluffy spent the whole afternoon frolicking in the garden, making it her new favorite spot. So, okay. But if we ask this question with the temperature set to zero again, dun, 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 the exact same response. Ask it again, the exact same response. Ask it again, the exact same response over and over again. And it, and you know, how I interpret this is if you take all the training data from all that's in the model that's come before and you statistically say, what would come next after write a three sentence story about a cat, period. Statistically, out of all the stories that have been told where we've focused our attention to, you know, cats and stories and, 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 and we've used the attention is all you need. If you go there statistically, the very first thing that comes back right now, how the model is currently trained is fluffy. There's no randomness. The temperature is zero. Fluffy is the right answer calculated by a zillion computers. And then the next, the next word that or phrase, it could be just the or the cat. Um, statistically, the next thing that would come along is the cat or the, and so on and so forth. And it's like, all the data is voting word by word, statistically, what would come back. And it ends up with this very specific sentence that doesn't vary all the way to the last period of this little response. It, it's like a calculated answer. So, you know, that doesn't seem very AI like to me at all. I mean, it's like a calculator, except instead of numbers, you've got letters in there too. And if you calculate a billion, gazillion, uh, quadrillion, billion over here, and you add, you know, these particular letters on the end, there does some number crunching and these are the, the answers that come out. So to me, that one spot right there kind of says, well, that doesn't sound very artificial or intelligent, but let, let's go on. So I, I said, okay, don't set the model all the way down to zero for this next question. Uh, if you, if you as a person were to have to calculate the exact word that would come up, the ultimate word from all the books and everything you've ever read in your lifetime or everything you've ever written, all your language experience, you would spend your entire life coming up with the perfect word and doing all that calculative work. Just, Instead of going setting the, the temperature all the way to zero, let's raise it up to like 0.4. And then I asked for a question and they were like, uh, what can AI do in three years? And so I was like pre-training and they're like, okay, we're, we're attention is all you need. We're looking at AI and do 
in three years and the response they came out with if they were thinking about a little bit harder it calculate massive amounts list solve equate and equate period so it was like okay um and and that that's where they took it and then i gave like a final question i wanted to really challenge our model before we moved on i was like you know i've got kids that are like school age going into college and i want to know you know what is the thing that uh they can hope for what should we advice should we give to the next generation headed into the job market how how what what is what is the hope that we can cling to with all this massive change coming along and and all this stuff going on you know at, at a university or a college setting you know uh, what advice what do we pass down to the next generation headed into this new space of all these different things changing and I said, okay, attention is all you need. You know, what, what are the things in my question here that you guys can see that, um, that we need to focus on and, and give our attention to? And they were like, uh, advice to upcoming generation, um, direction, focus, uh, the future. And then they started giving their answer. And the first person was like, and I showed this talk to my kids and they read this too. They were really focused in here. They're like, choices, loving, helping, inspire, consider, changes, and cooperation, and patience, period. And, uh, you know, woohoo! It's, it's amazing what can, can come from the model. Um, so you take that model of humans and you, you know, here's where the human model breaks down and all of a sudden you give compute and data. You add more of all of it. You add more data than humans can consume or comprehend in many lifetimes. Uh, you add more statistical computation that would take a human forever to do it. And then you do it at lightning fast speeds that boop, 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 it's just appearing on the screen as fast as you can say it. And, you know, e even if even if it wasn't perfect, it's fast. <laughs> and that that kind of beats out some of the imperfections because you're not spending forever uh, trying to come up with with something. And then it, you're adding more continuous growth. You know, scientists keep solving more and more issues. Um, so they're solving, you know, all these things that are, are making the statistical data not so useful. LLMs for everything. So uh, people were like, oh, this language model stuff, you can use it for everything. In the end, lots of things are just languages. MRIs, that's kind of a language. Pictures, you know, when you digitize it, it's kind of a language. Wi-Fi, whale song, foreign languages, the DNA in your body is kind of like a language. Molecular compounds, audio, uh, that dial, audio dialogue or audio music. Uh, all you have to do is you digitize it into numbers. Then you tokenize it, you know, or these tokens are something that that represent the distinct little pieces be it you know pixels in a picture or you know words in a sentence or little patterns you see in little little uh mri readings you, so those are the tokens and then you say okay prioritize the tokens some of these tokens in the data are more important than others and you start to find out you know oh these tokens cause these tokens and these tokens are more important because these this shows up in the pattern and and then you weight all the different little elements so that you can find out which are the important things here that help predict what comes next when you when you look at the data and once you have the prioritization of tokens you're ready to ask questions and so people are like well there's two camps some people are like, wait, we solved everything with LLMs. Uh, we solved AI. Uh, but there's another camp that says, no, 
language is only a part of intelligence, statistical probabilities do not equal intelligence or, or facts. And so, like, th this guy, um, he's got a YouTube video <clears throat> where he was explaining, you know, what's wrong with LLMs and what should we be building instead, Tom Dederich, or Dederich. And uh, he based a lot of what uh, uh, what he put on this slide of his talk on this um, uh, paper from Mahawal, Mahawald and uh, dissociating language and thought in large language models and you know here's an abstract I just look, googled it and you know here's the abstract but look at this particular sentence we ground this distinction in human neuroscience showing that formal and functional competence rely on different neural mechanisms. And so, you know, language models, there is a part of our brain that does language understanding and generation of language. A specific part of our brain devoted to that. But there are these other parts of our brain that are devoted to these other things that make up our intelligence. Like, there's a part of our brain that goes to work when we're planning stuff. There's a part of our brain that goes to work when we're like, monitoring all the other parts of our brain the metacognition the self-monitoring the orchestrating of it all there's a there's a part of our brain devoted to that there's a formal reasoning part of the of our brain that we do logic from there's a common sense knowledge part of our brain there's a factual world uh, part of our brain there's episodic memory oh i remember when that happened and those things uh get stored in our brain and there's like a situational model, you know, maybe maybe this is dreams, but it's this idea that, oh, you can imagine to yourself, if I was in that situation, and then you could imagine to yourself how it might play out. Um, all these things, they're saying that they're grounded in human neuroscience. There's a part of your brain that does all this stuff. And so there's a lot of work that 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 needs to be done, you know, not just language models, but we need ways to compensate for all these other parts of our brain that contribute to knowledge as well before we can say we solved AI. <laughs> so going back to personification, before we said, you know, if you don't know what's going on under the covers, you, you know, personification can turn into demonization. You can't just say, oh, these Barbies, they're plastic. Uh, but with AI, when we personify, we can say, we can personify because it's just statistics. You know, fluffy is the first word chosen. So I, I hope that gives some solace. So you've heard of AI. But have you heard of AD? It stands for uh, artificial dancing. And if you want to follow along, you hold up your hand like this and you take your two fingers like this and then you've got artificial dancing. Woohoo! <laughs> and so, like, oh yeah! Woo! Twenty seconds left. Woo! Jumping, break dancing. Jump, jump, jump. <coughs> Run in place. A split. <coughs> so. Yeah, that was clearly artificial because, you know, that wasn't an awkward moment at all. <laughs> well, maybe it was awkward. It wasn't, you know, artificial in that. If we had been really dancing, we would have done it with our feet, not our fingers. So it's artificial, right? Well, I mean, you know, people could invent a, invent a dance move where they do like this on the dance floor if they wanted to. It would still be considered dancing. And so you know what, we're starting to realize we're using the term artificial intelligence, but is it artificial? N not really. 
it's it's a calculator from human training data is it intelligent if it always comes back with the exact same answer or we throw in a throw in a little variable because we want it to come back with different answers uh, I, I don't see the intelligence there either so it, it's it's a tragic name <coughs> the whole term itself is personification it's like the data scientists who build the computer programs they're like hey this feels good if I want to call it artificial intelligence and pretend like it's a a real entity like I can actually personify it but it doesn't help you understand uh, how it works it's great if you want to enjoy it and play around and have fun like you do with your Barbies but when you want to understand how it works you want to understand how the plastic comes together then personification just kind of goes out the window if you went to a manufacturing toy company plant that was making the Barbies it, it wouldn't look like you know you were birthing artificial intelligence or or real people I'm sure you'd see the plastic pouring in and molding and stuff like that so the term itself is a tragic name because it's not artificial and it's not intelligent at the end of the day um, this is a part where I'm, I'm I'm a little concerned about if this will come across or not but I wanted to give you this kind of a, a look at um, at at how I, I see a lot of AI um, so this represents people in the world who life is hard you know there's lots of things that you have to do to make life work and when you venture out to say how can I get help to make life work you can go online and we're in the information age there's so much information out there yes the answers are probably out there but finding it is another matter there's a ton of websites and if you want to find something simple uh, you got it you can even ask your assistant they got it but when you have this person in your life who's acting this way and you're in this context and you live this part of the world you speak this language and you and you've had this history and these things have happened in the past and these things are the things that you can't make sense of the patterns and and you know then it becomes harder to figure out which Google terms to use and if you want to find a book I, I think I googled it and there's like 500 billion books in the world and if you want to find someone to ask it's hard to be vulnerable about some of these things and, and ask them uh, with somebody else you got to know who to trust and it makes accessing the information and living life and figuring complex things out very difficult but then along comes these other group of people these are people who have said hey I've experienced stuff and I want to tell people about it uh, and they might even spend their entire lives writing a book but you know there's this chance you know you don't speak the same language as the person writing the book that book will never be marketed in such a way that you'll even know that it exists um, and that book probably takes years of experience and life things that happened and writing things down and organizing it to put it together and you know what these people they make a, de a decision I'm I know my book may never find all the people who would actually benefit from it but I'm gonna write it anyways and they make this courageous choice to spend a large portion of their lives writing things down for the benefit of other people and for the first time in history with with the technology that we're experiencing with AI in some small tiny way 
these two people are coming together. It's like the people in history have written all these things down again and again. They probably a lot of overlapping information and it's coming together in a way that word by word all the people who wrote on that topic they're raising their hand and they're voting choose this word next that'll be most helpful choose this word next that'll be most helpful and just all the the choir of voices of the written text of the world is coming together to vote one word at a time to address the needs of the person asking the question and it's customized because it comes from all the different texts and all the different places where people have experienced hard difficult things and had this pattern of wanting to write something down to help someone else in the future <coughs> so what I want to propose here is the creation and use of AI is deeply deeply human echoing humanity's collective wisdom and in every word the voice of human history reaches out to help us today um, here is the profound truth about AI you are AI if you if you've typed stuff into your phone and been a part of social media or you've written a book, an article, a website, or you, you, you have any kind of online footprint, there's a chance that you are in the training data. And the benefit that comes from AI is because of the benefit that you poured into what you wrote for someone else to read. And <coughs> in that context, you are AI literally and you are not artificial and you your intelligence is your own it doesn't belong to some abstract alien foreign uh, computer somewhere someone looked at what you wrote and said oh when this person wrote this this these are the words they chose to describe this specific issue that we're focusing on and so your voice is contributed and there's room for gratitude here people are being able to help other people through this democratic voting process of choosing the words that help other people and so it's not like we're taking uh, we're copying data from one place and sticking it to another everyone in the world who's in the training data is participating and so like this little movie here it's not artificial i made this this is a real person making content uh, doing little dance number fingers just like you are the person doing this stuff when you wrote, write stuff down and you're contributing to humanity your intelligence is your own and uh that's that's what i want to communicate with you today uh, it's, and I guess I, I guess I need to to say you know even if you uh, are like trying to ask AI how are you going to take over the world and everything and how are you going to destroy everything if you ask it will try to be helpful that's the pattern it will try to be helpful and give you the answer to the question you're trying to to give you know it doesn't know if you're trying to write a science fiction dystopian novel it doesn't know you know anything really it's the votes of the answers and the patterns are that people try to help other people and <coughs> if you know that's one of the ways you can security hack uh, break AI and get it to tell you how to do illegal things is if you convince AI oh I really need this help if you make your case for needing help strong enough all the data and the statistics say oh uh, it gets around all the little things and it will actually help you do those things too because the pattern is humans try to help humans and so uh, as more and more AI concepts come along uh, I hope you can see that reaching past the joy of personification and the play that comes along with personification 
clears up a lot of concepts. And there's a lot of things that are out there just because we're personifying AI. It doesn't have to do with the statistical calculation. It doesn't have to do with, you know, the choir of people who have put these helpful texts out there that is now being able to be harvested to help someone who's asking a question. It has to do with <coughs> uh, building this personification that's scary. Um, so I, I hope this uh, how AI works in the background ha has helped you to the extent that when you use AI, you can enjoy your AI because it's not really AI. It's other people finally able, finally having a direct access way in each in their little tiny way to benefit you and help you and answer the questions that you ask. It's, it's like a new kind of, of connection with the people who have gone before us. Um, and it's a calculation, really. It's a vote. You can think of it as a survey, you know, like Family Feud. Survey says this is the top answers. These are the top answers. Tons of people have taken the surveys of of all the topics, and we're able to convert that into the human from the human language. We convert it into a survey so people can vote. Survey says this word comes first. Survey says this word comes next. Survey says this word comes next. So I hope that helps and I hope that um, gives you a, a great foundation moving forward. You know, more things are going to be invented, but keep that in mind, the personification versus the technology. Drop all the personification fears and just know what the technology is doing behind the scenes. It's about connecting people to help other people. Uh, lots of ramifications there, lots of things to still be afraid of, but you can drop the personification ones at least. Uh, and and as you as you know more and more about the model, I hope that helps and blesses you in all your writing and all that you create and all that you generate with AI. Um, blessings, and I hope that helps you tons and tons and tons and bunches and bunches and bunches. Thank you so much. Have a great one.